growth stocks, generally speaking, have had a long run of outperformance compared with value stocks. Is the trend now shifting? And how should investors think about their overall portfolio allocation? Back in the studio with us is Jacques Nela, Portfolio Manager for the Global Consumer Trends Equity Strategy. And joining us from Hong Kong, Arnaud van Rijn, he's Rubico's CIO for Asia Pacific. Good afternoon, Arnaud, super view from you too there in Hong Kong. Good to have you with us. Now, Arnaud. Good afternoon. We've spoken a lot about trends here. What trends matter for a value investor? Well, as a value investor, we're not particularly focused on trends. Of course, we would like to see some growth in the companies that we invest in. But we are also a little bit contrarian in the sense that in many cases, actually, you will find that when you extrapolate growth for too long, uh, then uh, you may be disappointed. And that's also what Fabiana talked about with Amara's law, that sometimes investors get too uh, bulled up on a certain sector and then are willing to overpay. And that's, of course, not what we want. So I don't dislike growth, I don't dislike trends, but I'm just very, very careful in not overpaying for it. So Jacques, we hear there how cautious Arnold says he is. Um, typical value investor speak. By contrast, a growth investor is very upbeat about the future and feels that uh, the valuations are justified by the future earnings potential. But in your case, this is also grounded in your confidence in the mega trends and the trends that you've identified. But how do you stay disciplined? Well, the discipline question is obviously definitely a question also that growth investors get asked a lot because they are sometimes seen as reckless or chasing growth momentum, etc. While as value investors maybe have a more natural discipline or a perception of nat uh, natural discipline because they look for cheap stocks, of course. But we have a very disciplined approach. I mean, we only invest in companies that are exposed uh, to these trends. And within these trends, we look for companies, uh, what we call structural winners or quality compounders. So companies that have a very solid market position, often a number one or number two in the their market, a competitive edge, so something that differentiates them from the competition and that enables them to earn higher returns for a, a longer period of time. And so by having, let's say, a focus on these quality companies, I think um, we are also very disciplined, but indeed it comes with a higher multiple. Okay, so that's the theory, but sometimes reality in life hits and it gets quite uncomfortable, as we know, over the past year or so. Life was very uncomfortable, but also from an investor perspective, many shocks. What, Jacques, for you, were, were some of the more difficult uh, experiences and also decisions that you had to make when you saw the, the market-related crash? But even with a recovery, it requires good decision-making. Uh, yes, well, obviously, March, April was uh, the defining moment for the market uh, last year. And I think that investors quickly realized that there's not only companies were not only getting hurt by the pandemic, but actually uh, uh, companies with exposure to e-commerce digital payments, online meal delivery, etc., were actually seeing their revenue growth accelerate. And so that was a bit of a defining moment also for our portfolio because that meant that we basically shifted and increased the quality of our portfolio by looking at the companies that could uh, really benefit from the pandemic. So that was, yeah, I think an important moment in 2020. Right. Arnold, how did you experience the COVID-related sell-off? But I would imagine that the recovery was equally challenging for you from a value perspective. You were watching your, your growth colleagues gloating at the outperformance of these fabulous tech stocks, which you <laughs> probably don't own. So how did you experience that? And how tough was it yeah. for you to stick to your guns? Yeah, absolutely, Erika. That was a really tough period for us because, like I said, we are basically betting on some mean reversions that some of the trends actually don't accelerate. But this is exactly what happened, like Jack discussed, some of those sectors that are in that uh, e-commerce space, for instance, saw their growth accelerate, whereas we were thinking, well, it's probably going to taper off and the expectations are too high. So as value investors, we experienced a very, very nasty year of 2020. And it was really difficult also to keep clients on board and looking through this, yeah, this uh, shorter term acceleration of some of these trends where we say, well, don't think that uh, our stocks have no future, right? They, they will come back, but they just need a slightly different macroeconomic environment. So we had long discussions with clients asking us also, well, when will that happen then? When will we see value stocks go uh, and outperform again? And I've always uh, said to them, well, it really depends on where inflation is going to go, where our interest rates going to go. And of course, first thing that happened in 2020, interest rates collapsed, oil prices collapsed. So inflation was way down. So that gave us another jolt down. 
but the, what we're seeing right now is a much more hopeful environment where indeed you do see, and I noted that already in the food inflation uh, discussion, you see inflation in food prices, you see inflation in technology prices, which means that there will be more inflation in the world today. That also leads in turn to higher interest rates. And you see that particularly on the long end of the interest rates uh, curve now, that interest rates are starting to rise. And that also means for a value investor where the cash flows are in more in the near term, that in our discounted cash flow analysis, we are less uh, vulnerable to higher interest rates because we get the cash flows in the next five years. The growth investor may get the cash flows in year five to ten only. So that's a big difference. And that yeah, has meant indeed that some investors have started to nibble again on value investing. And some of our clients are indeed putting more money to work into value. Sounds as though you're having some tough uh, conversations with clients. Well, we asked the tough question uh, to our social media followers. We put this question out on Twitter. We asked, again, rather cheekily, after years of underperformance, value stocks will finally stage their comeback uh, in 2021, uh, outperforming growth stocks then. And we gave two options, true story or wishful thinking. Interesting outcome. The outcome was more or less balanced, but nevertheless, 52% felt this was wishful thinking. In other words, that growth stocks, sorry, I'd note, would continue to outperform. Jacques, your view on that? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit surprised by the outcome, actually. I would have expected, also given the rotation that we've, that we've seen so far this year, that there would be more belief, let's say, in the, in the value, stock, uh, value stock rally. I mean, I'm very convinced of the companies that we own in the portfolio and of their long-term future. So I'm uh, I'm definitely in the in the bull camp for growth stocks over the long term. But I would have expected, let's say, the more recency, a bit of recency bias, let's say, in the in the poll result. Yeah, certainly. I've noticed some possibly some behavioural biases in there. Uh, your response to the poll findings? Yeah, also quite surprising. Uh, on the other hand, I, I think there's two, two things that people need to realize. Um, when you invest in a benchmark now, even if you're a passive investor and uh, hopefully not too many of our clients are, then you will find that your benchmark is also tilted more and more towards growth stocks as a lot of value stocks have been kicked out of the benchmarks as they become smaller and more illiquid. Uh, the second thing to note is that I think there's also a belief among some investors still that value has no future and that we are just investing in dirty companies, companies that uh, are going out of business and are going to be overtaken by the companies in Jack's fund. And that's exactly what we focus on also then, that we look for value with that future and where companies are actually healthy. They may not grow so fast, but they definitely have a future and they won't be eroded. So. That's my response to this uh, poll. Right. So there you have it. Value is interesting and cool and exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Um, well, and, and so is Arno. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jacques, if, if you look at trains, so we've discussed some trains, but which trains do you feel still have a lot of runway? Well, one of the interesting trends that we have in the in the portfolio is uh, with regards to pets. So we've seen a big increase in pet ownership uh, during the pandemic. I mean, people were locked in their home, and maybe families spent more time uh, at home, and so they decided to get uh, to get a pet. Obviously, that uh, cat or dog will need to be fed, uh, need to get its shots, etc. So companies that are operating in that uh, in that value chain basically have not only registered good growth in 2020, but will probably also continue to see good growth over the next three to five years. So that's something that's quite defensive because people uh, tend to cut back on their own spending, let's say whether it's apparel or restaurants, etc. before they cut back on, uh, right. on pet spending. So it's definitely uh, a trend that we think has uh, a long runway yeah. of growth. Resilient and defensive. Now, Jacques, you yourself, you didn't acquire a pet, right? But no. You had a baby. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> spending there is almost as... Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. More my, so. And my wife would like to add a pet as well, so... There you go, it's in the mix there. Um, I'd note which trends are attracting your attention? Uh, now, there is actually quite a few trends that are uh, important now for value investors. Uh, one of them, I would say, is in the telecommunications sector. This is something, yeah, we've all been addicted to our, our phone and mobile devices uh, over the last couple of years, and we won't uh, give up on our mobile subscription anytime soon. Yet these companies have been dogs in the market as their profit growth has been very limited because they've been investing, investing, investing and went from 3G to 4G and now to 5G. And they're nearly done with 5G now, which means that there is no 6G really to speak of. So they're going to be largely done with their investments. And that means that as the 
consumption will continue and the subscriptions will continue, that they will see more and more cash flow come into their uh, bottom line. So we look at that as a very, very interesting sector from here on. Also looking in Asia, for instance, some of the financial companies, there's been a lot of talk about fintech overtaking the banks. But in many Asian countries, actually, the banks are at the forefront of innovation in China, in Korea, uh, where we see, uh, and in India, where we see the large banks actually um, being the first ones to develop uh, access to accounts uh, via the internet, etc., and thereby also offering mobile wallets, etc. So they will not quickly be overtaken by the fintech startups, right? So they may not be pure plays, but they have a very fast growing element inside them, yet they're trading at very low multiples. So these are very interesting things that the pure plays trade at very high multiples, whereas the, the mixed plays that are also at the forefront of this are actually at very low multiples. So those are two trends that I see are really interesting for a value investor. Right. So careful stock selection combined with uh, trends watching. I've noticed another element uh, that's important from a value investor perspective is looking at div dividend yields, um, using that as a stock selection metric. Uh, do you see any opportunities here? Yes, absolutely. That's indeed good that you mentioned that. Uh, there has been, of course, this decrease in long-term interest rates. Short-term interest rates are at zero. People are looking for alternative. The search for yield is often mentioned. Yet high dividend yielding stocks have been massively underperforming the market over the last couple of years. And even in the year 2020, where you thought people would be looking for defense, actually, no, investors went for a lot of offense uh, and, and left those, uh, those high yielding stocks uh, for dead. And well, telcos are one of them, and some of the banks are also part of that, uh, that group of stocks. And I think, although on the long end, interest rates are starting to pick up, and that's a good thing, uh, on the short end, interest rates will stay low. So I do think that eventually the interest in high-yielding stocks will definitely come to the fore. We've seen people move from government bonds into high-yield bonds. I think the next step will likely be for people to also move from high-yield bonds into high-yield stocks. Right, so you anticipate that as a trend and then position portfolios accordingly. That's my understanding of what you've said. Um, we've got an, a question that's come in through Mentimeter. I'm going to be, um, it's a tough question for a gro growth investor. So Jacques, I'm going to ask you. Some stocks exposed to trends are hyped, it says, as a statement with plug power as an example. <laughs> What's the view on the impact of rising interest rates? So I know it's already sketched, uh, outlined the risks of that. Look, that's, that's a very good question. And also a question that we are asking ourselves, right? Because this is the first time in a while that we've actually seen uh, interest rates rising and rising and rising quite rapidly and it has had a negative effect on growth stocks because obviously growth stocks derive a lot of their cash flows indeed from the future five to ten years out as uh, as Arnaud said and in in some cases even longer so discounting them at higher rates leads to uh, leads to lower equity values that's that's indeed uh, indeed correct but I think we've also seen a little bit of uh, a quick correction already so far uh, so far this year and maybe one that was a little bit necessary after the big bump we've seen in uh, in 2020 so I, I see this correction as a healthy correction for growth stocks, but still the underlying trends are still fully intact. We don't expect consumers to go back to paying with cash now that they've been used to paying with their phones or with their uh, or contactless. Basically, we don't think they will cut down on online meal delivery, for instance, now that they've used it, etc. So we think these trends are fully intact and that the companies operating in these industries will continue to see revenue and earnings growth for the future. Right. The question is, what multiple do we pay for them, of course? And that's yeah, basically for the market to decide. And for you to stay disciplined. Exactly. Right. Now, I note, you know you're amongst friends here, so you really can tell us. But <laughs> uh, are you at times tempted to invest in growth? Of course, like I said, I don't dislike growth. I don't want to overpay for it. But absolutely, uh, for me as a value investor, I still believe that uh, people are often a bit open to, uh, to, to hypey uh, valuations, like the question was also asked. So for me now, uh, I, I would tend to stick with value investing. But I must say that uh, talking to my son, uh, investing for his university fund, we had that discussion about where do you want to invest then, and there was all these Rubico funds. And uh, he said, I'd like to invest in the Consumer Trends Fund because those are companies I can relate to. And I said, well, yeah, be aware, but some of these companies actually have quite a high valuation. And then he said, well, I rely on the fund manager to, of course, switch out of these stocks well in time before they Pressure are really on. too expensive. <laughs> so, yeah, there's a market for both, I would say.
So Jacques, cl uh, clearly you need a good value investor to, to sort of moderate the overall portfolio allocation. But so I'll ask you the same question. Are you tempted to invest in value in your personal capacity? Uh, of course, yeah. we can check up on this, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> no, but yeah, yes, of course. But I, I think obviously there's a lot of debate between growth and value, but all investors are basically looking for undervalued stocks, right? And I mean, Arnaud is looking at value at the traditional way, basically looking for undervalued stocks with a relatively low PE. And I invest in companies that are maybe not undervalued today, but that I expect to generate significant value in the future. And that is normally in a, in a three to five year uh, period. So definitely uh, looking for undervalued companies as well, even within, uh, within the growth strategy. And also in the personal capacity, of course, I invest in both growth and value. Well, there you go, Jacques. Thank you so much. Arnaud, thanks for joining us.